Good morning, guys. Um, I hope you're all well and staying safe. And welcome to uh, the, one of the series of the webinars that uh, National Youth Agency are, um, are putting on at the moment. Um, my name is Deborah Tarras, and I am the Principal Youth Work Specialist for the National Youth Agency. And it is, um, it is so nice to be able to, to see you all, see you all today, albeit virtual. Uh, just before we start with Craig, I just want to go over um, just, a, a, just a bit of housekeeping for you all. We are recording this today, um, so this will be available on, you, on, uh, on our YouTube site and that will get sent out. So just want to make you all aware that that's, that's what we're doing at the moment. You will all be put on mute, so I will ask you to please mute your mics. Um, just for courtesy for Craig, that's all. Um, because obviously as he's, um, as he's delivering... I found the iPad, but I didn't have time to see it. Oh, can I just... Ask you just to put yourselves on mute or Lydia, Lydia will mute you all. There is a chat facility uh, with, within this so if you do have any questions please put it into the chat uh, and my job hopefully will be to try and um, uh, be able to obviously ask those questions to Craig at, at the end. Um, so I think that is everything. Again you've got the facility to raise your hand as well if there's anything that you need to immediately ask but I would just say is um, I hope you've got your brews. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. So I'd like to introduce you to Craig Pinkley, uh, and he's going to be doing the webinar on young people, um, youth violence and lockdown. So Craig, I think it's over to you. Thank you for the introduction, um, Debbie. Um, again, just before we start, can everybody just make sure that they're on mute? Um, I've just heard a few people talking um, in the background. Um, so can we just make sure that it's on mute um, before we start? And then also some of you might want to might want to get a notepad and pen. So I'm going to give you a few seconds just to um, get yourselves together, and then we're going to go full throttle. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for joining us um, this morning. The National Youth Agency and Solve the Centre of Youth Violence in conjunction um, with our audience. Um, first of all, again, um, I appreciate all of your time this morning. Um, loads of people have um, subscribed to this particular event. Um, unfortunately, we only can cap it at 100. So there may be a few people that you know that may be a little bit upset, not our fault, but we'll have a conversation about what that looks like over the next coming weeks. So for the next hour or so, I'm going to be just talking about some of the issues that our children and young people have been facing during COVID-19, but more specifically around issues around violence. I know there's a number of youth work practitioners in the building um, and may have a series of questions that they want to ask. Again, there is a live chat. Um, that's there. I'm not going to look at the live chat whilst I'm presenting, um, but I will attempt to look at it at the end. If I feel that there's a possibility that we may go over, I will alert you. Um, and if I don't have the opportunity to answer the question at this particular segment, then I will um, give you my contact details and then we'll have another conversation in regards to the questions that you may be asking. So just as kind of a, a opening um, statement for those that don't know me and never met before, never seen me before ever. My name is Craig Pinkney. I'm the founder and director of a company called um, Solve the Center for Youth Violence and Conflict. Um, and in terms of kind of my background, I'm a criminologist. Um, so ultimately my study is about um, understanding young people and why they commit particular acts of criminality. 
Um, I'm a youth work practitioner. I'm a trained qualified JNC youth worker. Um, I've worked for about 16 years in a range of different types of settings from managing youth centres to detach and outreach work, residential care, working and supporting with um, youth offending, probation, um, work, done some work in a prison estate, predominantly YOYs, um, done some work in child secure, and done a lot of kind of international work with organisations supporting young people in a range of different types of ways. And as an academic, um, for many of you know, I do write around some of the key issues that we're talking about. Some of you are more familiar with my work around um, unrolled youth work, which is a terminology that kind of encompasses um, a kind of different form of detached youth work. Um, and currently I'm doing my PhD that looks at the role of social media gangs and violence, um, specifically within inner cities. Um, I also am an advisor for a number of um, organizations um, locally, nationally, and internationally, just to name a few. So violent reduction units up and down the country. Um, also the Home Office, um, Police and Crime Commissions in a number of our cities. And then internationally, um, I'm an advisor for the Ministry of Justice in Jamaica um, around strategies of reducing issues around violence. And I think one of the key things also just to bring a human element into it, despite all of the labels, is that I'm a dad. And, you know, and I think sometimes we have our professional hats on and we kind of forget about the fact that, you know, we're fathers, we're mothers, we're uncles, we're aunties, grandparents, neighbours, members of our community that are hopefully trying to enable young people to have the best opportunities um, that they can have. And for those that know me, just to kind of before we go into it, you know, everybody knows that I'm all about what I call bridging the gap, you know, so you have methodologies, approaches, academia, academia, papers, amazing reports that come out, but oftentimes we don't know how to connect that into a reality. And much of my work is about bridging that gap, what I call academia in the streets. So much of what I'm gonna be talking about today is gonna to be based on um, a lot of theoretical ideas, a lot of approaches that have been tried and tested. And also just to get us to probably think about some of the issues that many of us are facing and being challenged with. And I guess in terms of my journey over the last two decades, I always say that my work kind of focuses on the intimate relationships or my experiences that I've had with predominantly black men within the inner city, ultimately trying to make sense of why I was seeing many of them make poor life choices, joining street gangs, ending up in jail, mental health institutions, some of them becoming paralyzed or dying as a consequence to what I call street violence. So most of my journey working with children and young people has always been trying to understand why and how and what are the factors of which cause children and young people to end up in those scenarios where they may end up in prison, where they end up in a mental health institution or where they may end up, end up in the cemetery. And I think that kind of brings it to what I want to really talk about today. And we're talking about COVID-19. We know that uh, this pandemic that's kind of come out of nowhere um, and really has shifted the way that we think, the way that we behave in terms of our work in practice. We've had to shift. Everything now is online. Um, so we've really had to think very creative how we're going to engage with young people and their families in the communities of, that we serve um, in a safe um, particular type of way. And I would just like to say before COVID-19, we already had a series of issues, bearing in mind for those that work in youth services or have worked in youth services, you remember, you remember post 2010 and 11 when we had that recession, we were arguing that as a consequence of austerity, we we're going to see a series of things that were gonna be happening throughout British society. Things like poverty, deprivation, poor education, more dysfunctional families, issues around high employment, lack of resources, poor housing conditions for specific groups and communities and families nationally, issues around young people being exposed to high levels of trauma, multiple trauma, vicarious trauma, and so on and so forth. In my research, I talk a lot about fear and what fear does to young people and communities where they feel that young people particularly are involved in particular types of crime or criminality or antisocial behavior and the ripple effect that causes on not just young people but adults in general. Reactive interventions, meaning that we're doing the exact same thing over and over and over again. As I said in the beginning, my role and my world is all about bridging that gap between new data, new theories, new ideas, and merging that 
into interventions that are effective in real time. And unfortunately, what we do as a society is that generally when something happens, that's the point where we then step in and say we want to do something. And then also there's the level of staff competency as well. It's not just necessarily having the passion to wanting to work with young people, but do we, are we competent? Do we have the knowledge and skills and qualities to engage with young people in 2020 and beyond? And then also there's other issues around limited police presence within communities. We know due to cutbacks that police have had lack of resources, which also is a consequence to a lot of the issues that we hear about and see in the media. And many of us that had that frontline experience see within our local communities. And also that links to damage relationships between police and community where some communities, um, when we look at data around stop and search, or we look at death within police custody, many individuals have felt or feel that um, the way in which police have treated particular groups of people within society um, has an adverse effect on them. And we can just look at what's going on in America at the moment, but we're looking at injustice and we're looking at blatant racism, systemic racism that is historic, that we're now starting to filter out and see more overtly within our society. And there's also the issue around poor leadership prior to COVID-19 and the issue around dysfunctional families. And the reason why I'm mentioning those particular things is to set the context, because whilst now COVID-19 has entered and now happening and the pandemic is there, all the vulnerabilities of children and young people and families in particular have increased. And there's a bits of literature that we can look at for some of you have read the out of sight report that was done by the National Youth Agency. And there's a number of uh, two other reports that I think is really good if those of you haven't watched or read some of the content um, that is embedded within that. And I think what that does is it enables us to kind of understand where we are right now. And that's why I advocate for all of us to to look at these particular documents, to kind of get a frontline experience of those practitioners, those young people, whether they're male or female, affected by these issues. Because as just mentioned, vulnerabilities have increased. And whilst those vulnerabilities have increased, our challenges as professionals, as individuals that work with children, young people and their families, and work within the wider community, we have to face these challenges head on. Because guess what, the reality is, young people are still out and about and that kind of brings to my kind of concerns you may remember for some of you that are following some of the work that we do i presented a, a case and said that whilst covid19 is starting to unfold and the lockdown started to come down i had a series of concerns that um i presented um to local government in regards to children and young people and one of those concerns were that I believe that as young people, reflecting on some of the things that just came out in the National Youth Agency report, is that whilst young people are now are not at school and more young people are not being engaged by local authority and so on and so forth, we're going to have mass groups of young people bored, at home, fatigued, stressed out. And whilst they're at home, stressed out, fatigued and bored, we know that risky behaviour oftentimes is something that young people do. But you also have to think in uh, think of from a reality perspective, because young people have never experienced this before. And we're talking about young people that generally go to school, social, interact with their friends on a day to day, and now have been told that they have to stay inside. And whilst that was happening, we're seeing young people out and about, clearly not understanding possibly the rules. But there's also another factor as well, that whilst the vulnerabilities of children increase there's also vulnerabilities that also exist within the household we're talking about issues around domestic violence we're talking about domestic abuse in all different types of forms and these are the things oftentimes we don't talk about we oftentimes look at young people and say they're out and about just being careless not following the government rules but oftentimes not being critical and asking those fundamental questions of why is it that young people are possibly leaving home in the first place there's another issue that I also said was a state of my concern was that drugs, as we know that a lot of companies and organizations locally and nationally were being impacted by the cuts and had to shut down um, for a period of time whilst we were social distancing and trying to stop the transmission of this particular disease. We knew that also this was going to impact the drug market, which meant that the price of cocaine and heroin um, increased 
which also then means that individuals that are addicted to these particular substances may have to either pay more, but also means that there needs to be individuals that are out there potentially doing more risky behavior to try and get at least the financial um, similarity to what they was getting previously prior to COVID-19. And whilst that was a concern for me, the issue around exploitation and organized criminals were gonna use a range of different ways to engage with young people, um, to um, incite in order to inspire, motivate them to wanna to be involved in particularly the drug trade. So then we have the discussion and debate about young people again, potentially not in school, but then also those young people that may have been or classified as neat, young people that are possibly in pupil referral units, young people that have just possibly been suspended or excluded prior to COVID-19 and haven't been placed in an educational um, setting yet. And those young people, it's argued that are more vulnerable than potentially the young people that were socially included. But what I want to say though, is not to kind of categorize young people into two categories, because I would say all young people are vulnerable, but yes, there are gonna be young people that are more vulnerable than others. And then my other concern was the use of social media. And for those of you that know my work around social media, I talk about the impact of social media. So again, young people utilizing social media during the lockdown also increased. So we're talking about young people utilizing um, social media platforms like Snapchat, Instagram, um, YouTube, and all of those things have been um, on the increase. But we are gonna talk about social media a little bit more a little bit later. And I think whilst we're seeing young people out and about, and it seems as though that nobody seems to be engaging, this is a major concern for our society. And as you know, that many of us from the National Youth Agency and supporting organizations have been advocating for this idea that youth workers need to be seen as essential workers because we have a essential role, just like um, other key workers in our society, trying to protect and safeguard people from this virus. Likewise, many of us as youth workers also have a role to play in also engaging children and young people. Why? Because it shouldn't be left to just children's services to engage children and young people. And it shouldn't be just left to the police to enforce um, government guidelines around social distancing um, and so on and so forth. So what I want to now talk about is violence because constantly we've been hearing about a number of reports of young people being involved in antisocial behavior or violent activity. And it's been a bit of a distortion in terms of what the media has also demonstrated versus those frontline experiences and the narratives that come from young people that live within particular regions or what some would say are environments that are hostile or hotspot areas. And I think when we kind of look at the media footage and the media kind of um, coverage around these particular issues, these are just a couple of he um, headlines that I've been seeing. So crime in the UK falls sharply since the start of coronavirus uh, lockdown. Coronavirus um, gang life has stopped because of the lockdown. Um, and you may remember some of these other ones where there was youth workers in different spaces talking about the number of gangs fall due to the stay home um, coronavirus advice. Now, I said that as a frontline youth worker doing detached work in local communities and nationally, currently I'm doing some detached work in um, Norfolk across um, that particular region. And I was saying, well, this must be a region to region um, behavior. So when we kind of see a lot of this coverage, it tends to come from places like London. And oftentimes we focus on London and the behaviors of young people in London and oftentimes forget about young people that live in different cities. So a London narrative of what's going on in terms of lockdown and young people may be different to Liverpool and Manchester, Nottingham, Bristol and Birmingham. And I think that's important because when we project these things within the media, it gives the assumption that young people are in home and engaging. And I'm not suggesting that young people and as many young people that are conforming to government guidelines. However, there has been loads of reports locally that haven't been reported in the media about violent behaviors that have taken place in our local communities. And that's ultimately what I wanna focus on because before we also look at the violence and make sense of the violence, we also have to also set context of where young people are at, meaning listening to the voices and the narratives to young people that live within particular regions. 
And one of the interesting things when I talk to young people on the street, I always hear this kind of conversation between conspiracy theory or I would say conspiracy fact. And you have young people having these conversations about 5G and 5G is the reason why we have coronavirus. Or we've heard young people say things like coronavirus isn't real, it was created in a lab or you'll have people talking about the reason why we have coronavirus is because of 5G and the government are plotting some scheme and um, some sort of um, hidden agenda, which is ultimately going to impact um, society or globally and um, people in an adverse way. And I think whilst young people are having these conversations and you can look on YouTube and Instagram and young people spreading different memes and talking about coronavirus and what they think it is, young people also start to develop an understanding of what they believe this pandemic is and how this pandemic impacts other children and young people. So some of you may be aware of young people saying things like, we can't get coronavirus. The only individuals that are going to get coronavirus are people that are elderly and young people um, that may have underlying health issues. And whilst that may have truth to it, we know that the virus ultimately can impact loads of different people in many different ways. But if that mindset is that I can't get coronavirus because I'm a young person, that may also help us to explain why we're having young people just out and about freely having parties, having barbecues, congregating in local parks, and nobody doesn't seem to can know how to contain or at least engage with young people that are doing or displaying these particular types of behaviors. And I think we just have to be honest when we're talking about young people. Young people don't care what Boris has to say. Young people don't care what the government has to say. Why? Because we're talking about rebellious young people. Young people have always had that element of rebellion, challenging, not following authority, and not necessarily in a bad way because we can look at history when we're talking about issues around injustice. And it's always been the youth that have always been rebellious and never taken information um, literal. They've always challenged it. They've always asked questions. But in this particular context, I think it's important to understand where our young people are at and how we ascertain where young people are at is having conversations with young people. So I always say that we can't put out academic literature. We shouldn't be doing reports. We shouldn't be speaking on behalf of young people if we're not having conversations with young people in here right now. But young people don't, and don't listen to what the government is saying. And this is the narrative that we hear on the street. So when we're talking about the issues around or surrounding youth violence, I think it's also important that we um, make it very clear what we're talking about. So when I'm referring to the concept of youth violence, I'm talking about issues around gun and knife crime. I'm also talking about young people that are involved in violence that's linked to street gangs, meaning young people that um, rep or represent a particular postcode area and they cause harm to other young people that may come from opposing postcodes. I'm also talking about drug wars, i.e. issues around county lines. I'm also talking about elements of extremism, xenophobia, whether that is religious or racial. And again, going back to the previous point that I made. So when we're talking about blaming particular groups of people as a issue of coronavirus, I've went out in the community and I've had young people say they're not like Chinese people. And again, kind of reminds me of some of the historical kind of viruses that have impacted us globally and how groups of people blame other groups of people for doing that. So you can look at what's going on in China right now, and you look at the statistics here from the Office of National Statistics, and it talks about people from BME groups are four times or five times likely um, to catch coronavirus or die from coronavirus. And then you look at places like China and see the way that China are treating people from African descent. And then you go to different parts of the world and you see the way that people are treating Chinese people. So when we're talking about issues around violence and where it starts from prejudice and then goes towards hatred and then behaviors of violence towards particular groups, I think it's important that we set context and know what we're talking about. So when I also refer to youth violence, I'm also talking about symbolic violence and that can be things around um, symbols, specific language. So a young person that does something like that or does something like that or does something like that to another young person, 
they don't necessarily need to say to a young person they've got a problem with them, but that particular symbol may represent an area code that may have a beef with another particular type of group. So I think that's also important as well, because when we talk about violence, oftentimes we only focus on the physical sense. We never look at the, sim the symbolism of violence. And I think that also links to another conversation that we can have later on about state violence as well. So just like when the police um, show up and people get anxious because they see the police uniform, not that the individual is necessarily oppressive or racist and the things that young people say, but the uniform represents authority. The uniform to some individuals represents oppression. And like in places like America, the uniform um, demonstrates death. So in the context of youth violence, when young people wear particular clothing that may be involved in gang activity as it relates to street violence, sometimes clothing, language and symbols can also be a form of violence as well. And I think I wanted to put that into category. And the reason why I pointed that into category, because oftentimes when we talk about youth violence, I think sometimes as professionals, we're saying youth violence, and I think we're meaning the same thing, and I'll explain what I mean. I know that was a confusing statement. And what I mean by that is when I go into forums and hear people talking about youth violence, they're only talking about gangs. And one of the things that I just want to quickly mention is that not all gang members are involved in county lines. Not all gang members are involved in elements of extremism. And likewise, not all groups that are involved in county lines are gang members. Not all individuals that are involved in county lines necessarily are involved in some sort of post-cold conflict. So there may be a series of factors that may be similar and overlap, meaning there may be a street gang that's involved in county lines that happens to go in a different area outside of their region and see another competing group that may be from the same region as them and have conflict with them on the basis of the from different postcodes and also trying to establish and also protect a particular turf, but not necessarily. Because I know a lot of young people that carry knives and carry guns that are not gang members. And I think that's the reason why I prefer the term youth violence rather than talking about gangs. Because when we talk about gangs, what you're doing is you're only talking about one category of young people. And what you're doing is excluding those young people that carry knives, carry firearms as a means to settle whatever conflict they have. And I think that is important to understand the context of where we are in terms of young people in British society young people are becoming more and more violent. Young people are increasingly um, utilizing weapons. And why is that? Because we have to have conversations about what is the dominant culture. And the dominant culture is violence. We live in a violent society. Young people watch films, they play games, they listen to music, they watch things from Hollywood, they watch Netflix that demonstrates violence. There's cartoons that show violence. I'm sorry to let you all know that, but Power Rangers wrestling is concepts of violence. Yes, it's entertainment and we call it entertainment. But one of the things I think we need to have a conversation about is the culture of violence within our society and how young people have embraced that violent culture. And we see that violent culture play out in a range of behaviors. So I'm gonna say it again, let's not put people into categories and young people into categories and view all knife and gun crime um, incidents and locate that to solely to do with gangs. There are a number of young people and increasing young people that carry knives. You can look at a lot of data that talks about schools and young people found with knives. And a lot of those young people may carry knives for a series of factors. One of those factors could be because it's fashionable. One of those factors could be because they're just doing it because their friends told them to hold the knife. Or some of them may carry a knife generally because they're fearful of somebody attacking them, robbing them, or they're just trying to navigate their way home um, to school, to college, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the key things before we just kind of move on now, when we're talking about the issue of violence, is what's happening during lockdown and how violence now is now going or moving from a social media sphere into what I call the physical sphere. I mean, in conversations that take place on a, in an online context and then end up in an area where individuals are now being harmed. So I think it's important that we pay attention to some of the new social media platforms that are out there. 
and some of them we're all aware of, but things like house parties, specifically during COVID-19, the subscriptions to house party and people, you know, wanting to communicate with their family, their loved ones, their friends. Likewise, young people are utilizing these platforms in order to communicate. But however, there's been a number of local reports where young people have utilized um, applications like house party to settle their beefs, to settle their conflicts. So you have young people from rival groups, rival areas, rival postcodes that are on house party having full blown arguments, talking about death, individuals that have may, may have been stabbed or shot over the previous years by individuals that may have um, lived in their particular area code and now have gone to prison for life and taunting um, and frustrating other individuals on a social media platform. And then after that's ended up on a social media platform in terms of an argument, 24 hours later, we hear of a shooting, we hear of a stabbing in a local area. Same thing in terms of Instagram Live. So now we know that a lot of celebrities nationally are utilizing Instagram Live. Influencers are utilizing Instagram Live. Just like we've had to change our way in engaging with children, young people, professionals, so on and so forth. Those individuals are utilizing their platforms. But guess what? Young people also that are involved in conflict are utilizing those platforms and going on Instagram Live to disrespect again to taunt and frustrate other young people that may be from rival postcodes. Likewise in Snapchat and also YouTube because music videos are still being uploaded. Individuals are still utilizing the lockdown as a perfect opportunity to engage with other young people that may be involved in other forms of conflict. And what we're now starting to see is that violence has been amplified in an online context where they're utilizing these particular platforms to settle beef, settle discussions, or to let other individuals know that they have a problem with that particular group. But what you have on these particular platforms is an audience. And what this audience often do is play as commentators. So just like you may watch a show or you may watch something on Instagram live and you watch it as entertainment for the players that are involved that are live, it's real life for them. So it may not be real life for me. It may not be real life for you because I'm just watching a fight online for my entertainment. But for the parties and the individuals that are involved, it's real life to them. And that real life situation can manifest into behaviors outside of that. And one of my major concerns during lockdown is that whilst we know that the government guidelines stipulates that we're supposed to be in our houses, we're only supposed to come out at that time, if we're going back a few weeks for an hour or so um, for exercise and so on and so forth, individuals that involve themselves in street gangs know that individuals that they know that they have a problem with are either going to be in that local area code or they're going to be in their house. So I put down here that lockdown has enabled street gangs and violent youth to catch their up slipping. Why? Because they know their home. So this will help us to explain some of the local reports that we've been having around individuals being shot at, households being shot at, and there's a number of articles from The Guardian, from The Vice News, that have been talking about these reports that the media haven't really captured and spoken about. And when I speak to young people on the front line, I speak to young people in local communities in Birmingham specifically, they're telling me about issues where there's been a beef or a conflict that's played out on something like House Party or Instagram. And because they know that during lockdown that individuals can't really just go to different individuals' houses frequently as they used to, they know they're most likely going to be at their house, they're going to most likely be at a girlfriend's house, or they're most likely going to be at their nan's, but highly unlikely going to be at their nan's because they're out and about. And for those young people that I've also spoke to, they say things like they've gone to everybody's house apart from their grandparents, because again, going back to my earlier point, young people know that Individuals that are likely to get coronavirus are either individuals that are from, from the elderly or individuals with um, underlying health issues. So then from an individual that wants to commit a crime against another individual, they know the likelihood of them being at their grandma's house 
or their girlfriend's house that also may have an elderly person in there is highly, highly not likely. So the only place they're going to be is in their geographical space. And that might help us to understand that individuals that have been shot or stabbed recently, a lot of those individuals have either been involved in some form of conflict with another group of people, or they either owe somebody some money. And these are the things I think that's now starting to unfold during COVID-19. And I think just as a kind of a disclaimer, you know, I'm just going to show a video. I'm not going to show it too long. It doesn't show too much um, gore, but just a reality of what's happening in places like Birmingham. I'm just going to show it for a few seconds just to give context and then I'll explain it. <laughs> So going back to my point, the video that I just shown um, for those that just want to get a bit of context. So this is a video of a group of young people jumped out a car and seen a young man um, near to his home and stabbed him. And the point that I'm making about this idea about anybody can get it is because what also now happens as a consequence to lockdown, if we go back to the point where I'm saying increasing numbers of young people are now outside they're out and about during lockdown for a range of different reasons. So if individuals that come from a particular area code that are involved in some form of street violence happen to be driving around another area code, what oftentimes is happening is that innocent people that may not necessarily be involved in any violence potentially also getting harmed. And you may have heard of and seen a number of videos that have been surfing through social media where individuals have been shooting at um, chicken shops where people are buying food, um, shooting after young people that happen to be standing up. And it's interesting because when oftentimes people watch these videos and see young people running from an individual that's either shooting a firearm or trying to stab some young people, one of the things that sometimes we also assume is that the young people that have been shot at or the young people that have been stabbed are involved in the conflict. But the point that I'm making is that whilst lockdown and you have loads of different types of young people hanging around outside food shops, their local places where they generally chill out. If you've got individuals that are coming from another postcode and just looking for anybody, if you dress, you look a particular type of way, you can be a target. So I potentially could be a target because I would like to think that I wear some trendy clothes and young people can identify with some of the brands that I wear. So I may just happen to be standing outside of a shop and potentially become a victim on the basis of the young people that are coming around to that area may have an issue with somebody that lives in that particular region, but it's not with me. And because they want to um, be violent towards anyone in that particular region, I potentially can become a victim. And that's a major concern for me. Because when we talk about this idea about how do we deter young people away from violence, how do we deter young people around joining groups that become violent, it makes our jobs much more challenging. Because if you've got young people that feel that they can be a victim on the basis of just standing outside of a chicken shop, then you can understand why some young people are going to join deviant groups or gangs in order to protect themselves. It makes perfect sense. Because unfortunately, we have proven that we can't safeguard our children and young people. And again, it's not the job of children's services. It's not just the job of the police to enforce that because there's, we're talking about thousands of young kids out of school across different regions. And there's no way that the police are gonna be able to manage all of that. And again, if you've got young people that have violent um, tendencies and young people that have ideas to be violent towards other young people, we find in these particular scenarios that young people that just happen to be walking in their area close to home whilst lockdown or COVID-19 is at play, they can ultimately come become the victims. So you've got individuals that are involved in conflict and then you've got individuals that are not involved in conflict, but both of them together can become victims to some sort of crime around gun and knife crime. 
And I think these are the things that we need to start asking new questions because post COVID-19, we know that based on the issues happening on social media, we know that these things have become a major issue amongst our young people. And I think one of the things that I think is really important to also kind of understand is that when we're talking about idea of social media, many of you will agree that young people are utilizing social media over and over and over again. And it's almost like if they don't have their smartphone, it's like they can't exist, they can't live. And I think, you know, just think of us as adults, I'm sure you've got into the car before and made your way to work and about halfway there, you realize, wait there, where is your mobile phone? And you remember the panic. And one of the things that I think is important to also understand is that there's a lot of literature that talks about this idea about social media and narcissism, this idea that narcissism is created um, through social media platforms like Instagram, um, like Snapchat, like YouTube, now house party, TikTok. I didn't mention TikTok earlier, even where now it's about just watch me, watch me, watch me. But I also have to take into consideration of the fact that whilst people have been on lockdown, people are experiencing fatigue, they're experiencing stress. So while some young people, especially young females, that have been demonstrating um, a range of behaviors on social media. I remember there was a rapper from London, Swarms. He was utilizing his Instagram platform to basically get girls to twerk. And you had millions of, of individuals that were subscribing and watching these particular things. And it was just watching young women disrespect themselves. And young men that are watching these particular types of things that are liking and subscribing. And it's not just young men. And I was working with a father and, and his son, age 12, was watching this particular type of stuff as well. So you have both males and females bored at home that are probably engaging and following social um, distancing rules and following the government guidelines, but yet still are at home, online, being possibly... Um, um, engaged by older individuals that are allowing them to watch these particular types of things. And then we can also talk about fraud, credit card fraud, and the increase of those types of behaviors also online. But the point I'm trying to make here is, as it relates to the violence, is that social media platforms create narcissistic tendencies. So this is not suggesting that all young people that utilize social media are narcissists. But what I am saying is that social media platforms creates the idea of narcissistic behavior, meaning look at me, watch me, and you again, just look at any young person's platform or just talk to your children, your nieces and nephews and see how they behave on social media platforms. Everything is about them. The way that they're designed is about them. Snapchat is about showing what you're doing every single hour of the day, every minute of the day, and you'll have young people all day. I remember seeing a young person not too long ago, Snapchatting to himself and almost walked into a lamppost because everything is about watching me. But as it relates to individuals that are involved in violent tendencies, because one of the things that I'm trying to explain here is how during lockdown, social media is contributing to shootings and stabbings, then the increase of youth violence within um, inner cities across the country. Because I argue in my work that narcissistic tendencies when challenged creates an environment for individuals to also want to demonstrate to their audience, going back to a previous point, that I'm really about that life. So what you have is social media platform, an individual, another individual, one group or another group, disrespect each other on a social media platform. Those particular individuals or particular groups have pride feel guilty, feel an element of shame, and feel that they need to respond back to the opposing group that they feel disrespected by. And whilst they feel disrespected, the audience is taunting them and telling them, you need to do something about it. So many of you that work with young people know that if it's a fight, if it's a conflict, it didn't happen unless it happens on a social media platform. And this is the culture that we're in right now. So historically, when someone would have a fight, it would always be in secret, it would be at the park, it behind, could be behind closed doors. Now, if it didn't happen on social media, it didn't happen. If there's not an audience, if there's not a group of individuals that are able to observe what happened, it didn't exist. So moving forward, one of the things that I also acknowledge in terms of my work is this idea about nihilism, this idea and concept that some young people in our society 
have this mindset that they're not going to make it past 18, 20, 21. They talk about it in their songs. They have these notions, get rich or die trying. I don't want to die young. I'd rather get judged by 12 than carried by six. And they say these nihilistic ideas because many young people believe that they're not going to make it. So whilst young people have these ideas, in COVID-19 where mental health is on the rise, issues around domestic violence is on the rise and domestic abuse and fatigue, stress, boredom, self-harming, suicide are on the increase. You've got young people with these particular mindsets that are engaging on social media platforms. And whilst they're on social media platforms, and again, social media platforms creates narcissistic tendencies, the narcissism engage with nihilism and social media only produces one thing. And that might help us to explain why a young person or a group of young people may be on Instagram Live or on something like House Party, having a discussion that turns to an argument. And those young people on that platform, 24 hours later or 12 hours later, go back into their own community and start shooting at houses that they believe parents, um, family members may be at. Now, the problem that I have with those types of things is, again, as my previous point, innocent people always get hit. So what if it's the wrong house? What if you lived at that house, but you don't live there no more? And one particular incident that I responded to in the local community is a very similar situation where there was a drive-by shooting and there was a family there. The young man that the young people were looking for doesn't even live at the household, but you had a mother you had a daughter and you had a baby. Now, from a social services perspective, that's dangerous, it's high risk. There's children that potentially um, can get harmed. But social media is the root cause. And I think one of the things that we also can talk about as well is because when we talk about root causes, we say things like, yeah, but Craig, you know, social media is not the root cause, you know, it's, it's austerity, you know, it's the recession, it's poverty, it's mental health, it's trauma, um, it's dysfunctional families, you know, it's the state, you know, it's poor education, it's poor housing conditions, it's, you know, putting particular communities on top of each other, so then you have those issues and scenarios where everybody's kind of turning on each other, and whilst I agree with all of those things, what I argue in terms of my research is that social media has become the new variable to explain why there's violence within our local communities. And I think these are the discussions that we also need to have. And also as a response from youth workers, how do we engage young people utilizing social media in a way that's gonna create a counter narrative to get them to possibly think a lot, of it, a lot different and also how they project particular types of narratives. And I think that just kind of leads towards the kind of national argument and the national discussion about public health because we would all argue that the violence that we see across British society is a public health issue. It's a disease. But how are we, we, we are re responding? So if you go back to one of my earlier slides when I talked about reactive interventions, this falls within the line of those reactive interventions because we're waiting for something to go wrong and then we're reacting. And when you look at Chicago, when you look at Baltimore, and you look at the violent interruption methodologies that they adopted to respond to violence in those particular spaces, and then you look at places like Scotland that kind of adopted some of the ideas from places like Chicago, we then understand this idea about being a disease. But however, in the UK currently, where we're still responding to the issue of youth violence, as a criminal justice issue, meaning we wait for young people to do something wrong and then we either punish them or put an intervention that we're gonna try and get them to backtrack. But at that particular point, it's too late because we need to be responding to the violence before it gets there. So like COVID-19 and we're in this particular pandemic, we know that post COVID-19, there's gonna be an increase in all of the issues that we're talking about, mental health, domestic violence, poverty, poor housing, high unemployment, issues around racism, xenophobia, state violence, symbolic violence, rising street gangs, exploitation of young people, whether that is sexually or that's to do with drugs. Issues around radicalization are gonna be on the increase and young people are gonna become more and more violent, disheartened because the context in which they're functioning is a violent and cultural context 
and that tells them in order for me to get where I need to get to in life, I'm going to need to take it. And that becomes the mindset that reflects the capitalist society that we live in. So if we are professionals and practitioners that want to respond in a particular type of way, we need to start to have a new conversation. And I've been advocating and many professionals that are on this and um, that are viewing this right now are with me in the argument that we're now saying that public health um, needs to be paramount of the discussion when we're talking about young people and violence and even more so when we're talking about the pandemic of COVID-19. So it has to be community led, meaning the state needs to trust the community to take those steps forward and guide them into how we're going to respond to children and young people and their families nationally that are affected by the issues that we're talking about today. And it needs to be academically driven, meaning we can't just be doing things based on passion. And this is a challenge that I say to all youth workers, especially youth workers that are now starting to come through with lived experiences. Brilliant. We need you because you have a role to play when engaging with children and young people that are at risk, young people that are on the periphery of being involved in a range of different things, whether it's exploitation, violence, gangs, in any form. We need you to help us and be on board. However, the data is telling us that it's not just your lived experiences that's going to enable us to get young people from A to B. It's also about the building of skills and attributes to be able to engage with young people in a range of different types of ways. So like myself, I constantly train, I constantly read, I constantly learn to try and understand the context of young people in 2020 and beyond. So public health as a response, as an approach, as a methodology to engage with the issues during and post COVID-19, it has to be community led and academically driven. And that academically driven mindset needs to be of also individuals in our local community and not somebody from America, individuals in our own country that understand the narrative and function from a, a um, insider perspective that they use the narratives of young people, the voices, the unheard voices of young people and our communities that they can help us inform our practice, our strategies, and how we can become the best youth work and community work practitioners that we can be. And it's all about developing that counter narrative. And many youth workers as informal educators, we go out there, we're spontaneous in our work, we, we're all about democratic and inclusive practice. We engage with young people in a loads of different types of ways, whether that is in a detached sense, an outreach sense, a center-based sense. But that counter narrative during COVID-19, again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to now start being creative and how we um, create those particular counter narratives. But it also starts with our positionality. Who are we and what are we? And this is where I always talk about trained youth workers, it's important. And the best youth workers are those that have a little bit of experience, have a little bit of training and merge those together to become those professionals that are in line where young people are at and meeting young people where they're at. Because that positionality starts from a person-centered approach where we put young people at the forefront. It's not about us, it's not about them, it's about young people. And we know that our young people come with baggage and even more baggage during COVID-19. So if we're just telling young people, don't be involved in county lines, don't be involved in gangs, when you don't understand the economic climate currently for young people and their families, and you don't understand what it means to live in a community where I'm petrified because the last time I was standing outside of a shop, shop some random geezer just came and shot at me. You can't tell me to leave a gang. You can't tell me to not be involved in counter lines. So our position of responding to children, young people that are involved with the perpetrators, those victims of the issues that we spoke about today, our position is to function on the insider perspective, meaning we need to talk to young people. We can no longer sit behind our screens on Teams and on Zoom and on all of the other platforms that we use to engage each other. We need to start hearing the voices of our children and young people and utilize that to use our positionality with all of the intersections and the brilliant things that we have and those intersections of race, class, gender, ability, the knowledge that we have of particular communities and those young people and bring that even more so in terms of our practice. And that's why I talk about the concept of on-road youth work. 
And for those of you that are aware of um, this methodology, it's just an approach. It's not the only approach, but it's an approach that I adopted specifically in the West Midlands to engage with children and young people that are victims of any form of violence. And what we did was we started on the principle that young people are at the center, that same person-centered approach, but acknowledging critical race theory and acknowledging the fact that the voices and the narratives of the unheard are likewise important in the journey to understanding what that process is. And all I say is that the concept of unrolled youth work ultimately, um, in a nutshell, just encompasses the intersection between youth work theory and criminology and bringing those ideas together because we're talking about youth crime, we're talking about youth cultures, we're talking about deviant youth subcultures. And whilst we're talking about those subcultures, I think that fits when we're talking about um, criminology and why young people involve themselves in those particular things. And what's important about this particular approach is that it seeks to use, as I just mentioned, that insider perspective, drawing heavily on those lived experiences those experiences of the professional, as well as those young people and the communities that we engage. Issues that happen in the moment. So as we know, COVID-19, we didn't expect it to come, but it's here. So in the moment, we get the views, the thoughts, the ideas of the people that can assist us in that process of doing that. But whilst we utilize this approach, it's also about acceptance. And that's why I said we're no longer we, we can be sitting behind our tables, sitting behind our computers, talking about young people, what we believe young people need and what they want if we're not engaging with young people. So whilst we talk about this particular approach, I just wanna quickly highlight some of those principles. And I know that time is fleeting at the minute because I wanna give you an opportunity to answer some questions. Um, Debbie, because I don't know how to find those questions, what you might need to do for me is ask the questions for me and then I'll answer, is that cool? I will do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in terms of the uh, unrolled youth work principles, these were the key things that when I originally started doing the research about what is it that makes youth workers um, most effective in working in hostile and violent environments? And what is it that young people are saying in which they need in order to have effective intervention that en enables them, um, or at least puts them on a conveyor belt to the assistance? So one of the things I talk about in terms of the principles is about language and behavior. And what that means is that the youth worker that functions from the insider perspectives, perspective has an understanding of language and behavior in different contexts. So I understand that me being in one part of Birmingham, the way that young people in behavior is very different to 20 minutes down the road. I'm not gonna know that unless I engage with young people. So when I engage with young people, I try to get an understanding of what the language and the behaviors are, and also the language that may create issues around conflict. So again, when you heard me talk about symbolic language and symbolic coding, that's important because if I'm in a particular postcode and a young person does that without saying anything, I may know a young person is actually talking about an element of violence just by showing a postcode because there's that kind of unseen, unheard narrative that comes from particular images. So as a youth worker working on the front line or a youth worker that may be in a chat right now that's thinking, how do I engage with young people? It's key to understand the behavior. We can no longer keep saying, back in my day, this is how we talk. And I don't like the way young people talk because it doesn't make any sense. Guess what? You're not going to be an effective youth worker because you are gonna engage with them, but they're gonna shut you off or they're gonna say the same thing you don't understand what we're talking about, so there's no point in having a conversation with you. No, it's not about us lessening ourselves in terms of our knowledge and intellect, but it is about enabling young people to also show their culture because language and expression of language is an aspect of culture. So when we say things like, uh, back in my day, and I don't understand what you're saying and you're not talking proper English, what we're basically saying is disregard your culture because I want you to understand and adopt mine. And as youth workers and as professionals that are seeking to put young people at the center and using that person-centered approach, what you're doing is putting you in the middle. And I believe a lot of youth workers do that because they're fearful of doing 
the knowledge, doing the research, doing that extra little bit to just understand what young people are. So the question is, how do you do that? Well, again, if you've got children, if you've got nieces and nephews and you've got neighbours, there's actually no book. And I'm against these books that give you these slang terminologies of what they mean. And I'll tell you why. Because whilst that book's been published, the word may mean something different at the time it's been published. So I don't fixate myself on particular words to mean one particular thing. And it's funny because I was in a meeting once and I heard uh, some people talking about cuckooing. And I was like, what the hell does this word mean? I was like, Craig, you of all people don't know what cuckooing is. I said, I know we're talking about counter lines, but what's cuckooing? I said, oh, are you talking about counter lines and young people trapping and putting someone in the bando? Because I've never heard a young person say cuckooing before. So we as professionals use language that young people don't even identify with. I've said to young people, do you even understand what county lines is? They're like, I don't know what county lines is. I've never heard of it before. So it's very clear that when we're talking about the concept of language, language is important and it's symbolic. So it's not about disregarding the concepts that we use as adults and professionals to identify and make sense of what we're talking about, but it is also important to understand where young people are at and the terminology that they use or they don't use. Dress code, I think, is really important as well because young people need to identify with us. And I'm saying again, in the concept of culture, all youth workers know this when you're working out detached youth work. What do we do? We put our trainers on, we put our tracksuit bottoms on, our hoodies on, and we hit the street. Why do we do that? We do that because we know that young people are going to identify with a hoodie. They know they're going to identify with a pair of Nike trainers. Yeah, and that's not me advocating that at the end of this, you guys need to go to Nike, by the way, or go to JD Sports and start buying loads of things online. But what I'm saying is, is about cultural expressions. And oftentimes when we're talking about developing affinities or breaking down boundaries to engage with different types of young people, sometimes when they can identify a series of brands that you're wearing, sometimes that's your door in. And some people will critique that and say, oh, I'm not really sure about that. But I'll say I'll put it in practice because I've known many times of youth workers that have gone out into the local community. And the moment that young people look at them, they look them up and down and they already make a judgment. And I'm agreeing that the judgment's not fair, the judgment's not right. But again, going back to a previous point that I made, we live in a what? A capitalist society that's highly materialistic. And in the films, in the movies, in the games, in the music, it projects that you have to have this particular tracksuit, you have to have this particular type of brand. And unfortunately, young people want to have those brands too. So all I'm saying is as youth workers is to be mindful that when you're engaging with young people, that just like um, language can be symbolic, dress code be can symbolic too. So yes, you have your ID badge, but understand that if you're walking out and you're walking with an armed uh, police officer or you've got an, an officer with his hi-hat on, already the symbol of that may mean something completely different to what you're trying to engage that young person for. So it's about bearing that in mind. And I also talk about a key core principle about the concept of unrolled youth work is about having knowledge and when I say having knowledge, I pull it into categories because it's not just about having knowledge about young people, but I think it's also about knowledge of the agenda. Do you understand where young people are at? So going back to my previous point, have you read that NYA report? Have you read the UK youth report? Because if you're talking about responding and engaging with young people during COVID-19, you haven't had a glimpse of any literature that was going on today, then you're just as guilty as the professionals that I'm talking about, we have to be up to speed. And I'm not saying that you need to be reading all of the big documents, read the executive summary, because the executive summary is gonna tell you what the whole report is about anyway. So it's about being in tune with what the agenda is, because we know what the police are now starting to bring forward and what they're going to bring forward post lockdown. But are we clued up to know that we can advise and support young people that may be impacted by these, uh, these particular issues. Grassroots knowledge is important. Who do you know on the ground? Who do you know on your local turf? Because those individuals are oftentimes the ones that are gonna give you that, that information, those stories that the media are not going to give you. So if I wanna to respond to a local co um, community because there's been a, a shooting at a household that hasn't been reported by the police or from someone from the local community, I can respond on the basis that the community have trust in youth workers 
because they may be able to respond to the violence. Geography. Do you even understand the areas that you live? Do you know what's neutral? Do you know what's a hotspot area? And I see this with a lot of youth workers where they do events, where we put on these big events and we say, we want loads of young people to come to these events and ignore the fact that for some young people, it's life and death traveling to particular venues. Same argument that we have with youth centers, that some youth centers post um, recession, you may remember where all of the small satellite centers were closed and then a little bit of funding that they had left, they resurrected these massive buildings and just assume that all young people from those local areas that may have attended those small satellite centers were just going to attend that one pretty big building. And unfortunately for some young people, again, it's life and death. So it's important that we also understand where we're engaging with young people in a safe space. We need to have a knowledge of history. Where did the conflicts come from? Are those conflicts coming from police intel? Are they coming from intel from the local authority? Or is it coming from the, your connections from the community? Because I would say those connections from the community are oftentimes going to give you that real in touch, in tune narrative that's going to enable you to assist you to be able to re respond with the organizations that you work in conjunction with. Going back to the point about interventions as well. What are the new approaches? Do you know any new youth, uh, youth approaches to engaging young people in a range of different ways? And if you don't know, and you're still doing the same football tournament that you was doing in 2004, in 2020, you can understand why young people may come for fun, but they leave and go right back to what their issues are. And I remember because two days ago, I had a conversation with two local basketball coaches and the conversation we were having is about issues around young people. And they were talking about me coming in and doing a workshop with those young people. And I said, what is one of the issues faced by our young people? And I said, well, other than violence, county lines. And I said, what's that? And that shocked me because we're talking about inner city professionals that work with young people all day, every day. And they don't even understand what county lines is. So how is it that you've got young people that you're engaging, that you're passionate about, but you don't even understand what their reality is? And that's the reason why we, we are met with so much challenges and conflicts when it comes to engaging young people. Because as young people say, we just don't get it. And part of our role on this particular approach is understanding it. Credibility is another key thing. Credibility sells. I know that because working in the street, there's no better credibility you can get when a young person says, I know my man, I know my girl, I know that youth worker, she's cool, he's cool. That's your rites of passage. Because what those young people are saying is that they've vetted you from their lens and they know you're an individual that's going to come in and do what you say you're going to do. They know that you might not be able to solve all of their problems, but you're an individual that they can at least connect with. So credibility is important and you're not going to develop a credibility in your local communities by sitting behind the screen by sitting on YouTube all day, talking about young people, but not engaging with young people. Social capital becomes really important. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Because we have to also be realistic that we can't do everything. We can't do every single role. So knowing a range of different professionals that know a range of different types of things, we can assist each other to support a young person or a family that may be impacted by a range of issues. Gender is important when we're talking about our approaches as well, because there's going to be roles that are specific to men and there's going to be roles that are specific to women. I know that. There's been loads of issues around sexual exploitation. And as a male, I'm not appropriate at that time to work. But unfortunately, some of us work for organizations where you have to engage regardless because there's limited numbers of staff. And I'm, I'm not arguing the fact that you know, that needs to change. But what I am saying is there's certain particular types of work that's going to require both men and women or singly men and singly women. So for example, when I've worked in a prison context, I always bring a female worker. Why? Because when I'm working with hyper-masculine young men, they see me and they see my structure and automatically for some, it's a point of conflict. So sometimes having a female worker reduces that hyper-masculine hyper -masculine trait or behavior that they're displaying in order for me to have a conversation. And then we also can talk about legislation and policy. 
especially for those of us that are thinking about going out, engaging young people on the street. We all have to be speaking from the same hymn sheet. And one of the things that the National Youth Agency have been doing is creating a series of guidelines to assist us as youth workers when we're trying to engage with young people in a safe way whilst adhering to government guidelines at that particular point. But I think it's also about managing conflict and having the skills. And if we don't have the skills, we need to develop those skills and managing conflict because conflict is going to come in a range of different types of ways. Things that we're going to see in the moment and things that we're going to be hearing about and those things that we're going to ultimately engage. And we could spend a lot more time on looking at the key principles, but these were just things that when I talk about my approach and how to engage children and young people in the current um, situation, in a technological space, um, and with all the different things happening in society, these are things that we can ultimately do. So in conclusion, one of the things that I think is important that we kind of just kind of highlight is that whilst we've been peeling back the layers over the last 10 years, whilst David um, Cameron um, and his Conservative government at the time were rolling out a series of initiatives um, and austerity was impacting youth services and disseminating or dismantling, sorry, youth services nationally. You know, we knew that there was a lot of issues that we're going to be facing. And currently in COVID-19 and post-COVID-19, I believe if we're following the methodology as youth workers that's on road um, in that particular context, um, that's a public health response, working with young people, our work has to look at issues around fear. Our programs have to be on issues around fear. We have to have initiatives and programs that focus on shame and what that is, uh, issues around guilt and how that can manifest itself into issues around violent hurt. We're talking about issues around mental health. We're talking about young people feeling disrespected. And you know, in any community where disrespect is at hand, young people are prepared to kill. And you can just look at the most recent fatalities in Birmingham. And I'm sure many people um, unfortunately had the opportunity to watch that video that was on social media platforms. That was around disrespect. A young person feels that they're disrespected and wants to use the most extreme form of violence to settle that because pride, shame, and all of those things are happening at one time amongst, amongst the group of friends and then that's what um, happens as a consequence. We need to be more trauma-informed. It's something that people keep saying, but do we understand what trauma-informed means? Have we been on any training that makes us trauma-informed? Do we understand trauma? Do we understand secondary trauma? Do we understand vicarious trauma? Not just for young people, but also for professionals. Because if we keep watching these videos and spreading them amongst professionals without consent, we also have a danger of traumatizing and we becoming also desensitized to the things that we see online. We need to also do work about young people and their ego, which links to all of the concepts that I've mentioned on the right. With work that I do with youth offending in Bristol, all I focus on with young people is ego, fear, rage, and anger. That's all we talk about. What are your trigger points? What is it that makes you angry? When you've had a violent incident or you've been in a situation where there's a conflict, let's rewind five minutes. Let's rewind 15 minutes. What was happening? What were your trigger points? Because me telling a young person that they shouldn't engage in conflict, they already know why they shouldn't be involved in conflict because they know the consequences. So we need to move past just talking about consequences and doing real work that reflects all of the things that we're mentioning. Identity, we know that when we talk about even Maslow's hierarchy of needs, principle, basic youth work 101, identity is key. We're talking about young people adopting toxic youth subcultures, gang cultures that they're adopting, that's destroying themselves and their communities, self-destructive. So if they're adopting and embracing negative and toxic um, cultural identities, we need to get young people focusing on an identity um, that isn't toxic, an identity that enables them to show their true selves and their true talents. And we can look at invisibility syndrome and W.E. Du Bois's um, double consciousness. And there's loads of things we can look at around that, but we don't have time. But identity is really important. And as mentioned before, respect is also important and understanding what that means in the life of a young person. And again, we can't, as professionals, as adults, as individuals that are passionate about young people, reject their culture, 
without at least trying to understand it first and communicating and engaging with them at that particular point. So whilst I'm now at my end of my presentation, first of all, I think we've only got about 10 minutes. I just want to say thank you all for um, giving me the time um, to present um, some of my thoughts about young people during lockdown. I hope it's been challenging. Um, I think it's also hopefully a food for thought, um, especially around our own children. And what I've just done is just hi um, highlighted a few um, publications that I've put out, one also with the National Youth Agency that may be um, of benefit and kind of talked about what I've just sifted through in an hour and 20 minutes um, in much more context. So, question. Great. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Craig. And I think we can all definitely say that it, 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 has, it has given a lot of us food for thought, those that are probably either new to youth work or some of those, some of us who are a little bit older as well, as you, yes. as you, you pointed out. And, and I think for me in particular, was, it was about you actually bringing out, looking at those narratives and especially about how we position ourselves as youth workers. Um, I think it's been um, really interesting in exploring the, the discourses and then looking at that power and the oppression as well that young people are facing. Yes. Um, but also for me in particular is looking at about those lived experiences. I do have a few um, questions that people put out. So please forgive me if I can't get through, through them all, guys. Um, again, you've got Craig's um, email. Um, so please send them to if I, if I don't get a chance to do everybody. But I'm just starting off, first of all, uh, Troy, um, sitting in your garden there looking, looking lovely in the sunshine. You, you, you sent a message through. Do you want to ask that message verbally if I, if I unmute you? Is that all right? Are you, on, are you on Troy? Yeah. Can you can you hear me? We've got you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, good, good morning, Craig. It's uh, good to hear you. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. Um, I can't remember the exact email that I sent. Um, but it was. Do you want me to, uh, me to say it to you? Yeah. That. Well, yeah. Say it. That would be that would be interesting. Thank you. And then and then please, you know, if, if I if I you can then expand on that. So Troy's asked. Um, Culture is continuously being blurred with race. Um, so Craig, what is your experience with projects that aim to look at aspects of identity from perhaps from a therapeutic perspective? Say that question one more time. So it's, it's a choice and culture is continuously being blurred with race. Yes. What is your experience with projects that aim to look at aspects of identity from a therapeutic perspective? I'm, I'm not sure what you say when you say it's blurred by race. What, what do you mean by that, Troy? So I think when you look at music, when you look at the importance of uh, dress, um, you know, fashion and stuff like that, um, a lot of people, a lot of young, young men, young white men, young white females, young black men, young black females, everyone and anyone, in, in, you know, in, under that umbrella um, will dress a certain way. Um, so when you're talking about hoodies, you're talking about Air Force Ones, you know, and stuff like that, 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 that kind of identification is, is synonymous um, with street culture and it's also synonymous um, in a negative impact from um, uh, the way that uh, black youths are uh, uh, kind of linked in terms of uh, youth violence, gang association, urban street gangs um, and I was just wondering what that might look like because you've spoken about um, your, your, your interactions with uh, young black men. Uh, criminal in okay hold on I'm just gonna write that down. Um, so what, what you're talking about, what I would argue is that what this book is ultimately talking about is before we start talking about young people mm -hmm. and what they understand to be popular culture, we mm -hmm. have to first start looking at neoliberalism and capitalism. Yes. We need to start looking at those things first because the things in which they're, and what I was saying earlier, what they're adopting as culture is what the capitalists are ultimately saying is what you need to buy. So mm -hmm. someone makes a song about Air Force Ones, they all buy Air Force Ones. Crypt and Conan um, are sponsored by Puma. Everybody wants a new Puma tracksuit. And it doesn't have to be necessarily negative, but any celebrity that is used, you know, for example, they don't use David Beckham no more. Him and Pasha are boring now, but we can use Stormzy because we know that Adidas still needs to sell. So before we talk about popular culture, it's also talking about the dominant um, capitalist cultures that also um, assist in the idea that young people need to have a particular type of way or, li or dress a particular type of way. The challenge that we have on the ground is that when we're enabling young people to have an identity, it's about what is that identity. And when you mention, I think I understand now when you're talking about blurred of race, it does two things. 
it one either projects a narrative that the only people that wear this type of clo clothes come from a black background or any individual that wears this type of clothing generally come from a deviant background. So what happens then is from the outside looking in, anybody that dresses like that is wrong. But then when we're talking about those rich people and they're wearing a Gucci um, hoodie that's £950 versus a hoodie that's £15 from JD Sports, who's been targeted as the individual that is potentially a perpetrator of something that they've ultimately never done. So I think we need to start challenging more about capitalist society and those um, culture things. So one of the things I'm talking about in my PhD, I ask a question, are we talking about um, exploitation or consumerism? Because what we need to know is that we're consuming these things because the capitalists, again, are the ones that are projecting these ideas upon us. So one of the things that I also say is there's absolutely nothing wrong with consuming as long as there's a balance. So when I work with some young people in the community and I use local entrepreneurs, or I use local businessmen, guess what? They dress exactly the same way that they do. But what they're showing them is when I got this, when I got these Air Force Ones or I got these nice pair of clothes, I worked for it. But not only that I worked for it, I'm going to show you how. So the blurred line oftentimes from professionals is that we're giving young people the narrative and we're challenging them on these ideas that oftentimes they can't even touch. But what we're not also doing is showing them that you can move a certain type of way, you can dress a certain type of way, but just understand that that also may come with consequences. Because if I wear a nice bag or a nice pair of trainers, and maybe somewhere, may someone may have an assumption that by having that means that I'm, I'm loaded and it's an opportunity to harm me. Thank you. The, um, the second half of that email of the question was, how do you, in, from a therapeutic perspective, trying to, you know, especially the end slides that you were talking about and dealing with the, the harm, the hurt, the, the shame, the trauma, um, working with, uh, you know, young people or even um, communities, um, how do you, how relevant do you think that therapeutic intervention or talking about that, that neoliberalism, um, how, how does that work on a macro when you're dealing with communities and community unrest, hypervigilism, um, hypervigilant communities that are just, you know, got their finger on the trigger and ready, ready to throw rocks. I remember when your Ted talk to you, like if the, if the, if the individual doesn't feel the warmth of the community, they'll burn it down. Um, so how do you, how do you kind of manage that? Not to kind of enrage people to think about consumerism and capitalism, when you're talking about communities that are kind of saying they put us here, I, they I make think, it easy. I, I, think, I think this is the uh, the kind of the point I was making in the beginning about rebellion. Mm -hmm. I don't think enraging enraging young people is is wrong as long as that we can gear it into something positive. No. Because if you look at any historic um, uprising of groups of people that are trying to assess their uh, access their freedom, they've always done things that, according to the law at that time, would have seen as um, a form of, um, or something that was ultimately against the law. So what I'm saying is enraging young people to hate their current situation is a good thing if we're going to pull it and help them. But this is the part where we need to show them, show them how to gear that into the right thing. I watched a video yesterday and it was a young man almost crying his, eye out, crying his eyes out when he was asked by a reporter, why are you rioting in, in America? And he said, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you. Why? But what I do know is that we are not the reason why we have injustice in our society. It's those that are racist that um, ultimately create policy and create a series of practices based on those racist ideas that impact people from my community. So I'm angry. So what we need to do and where we can step in is where is that potentially can become violent? We are the ones that can show them that can put that into something that is geared towards something that is positive, that enables them to see what it is. Now, the, the, I guess the wider conversation and the, one, the, the wider question is, is, as you mentioned, therapy, and I would argue, and you look at um, anyone's work of, you know, Dr. Leary's work um, that talks about post-traumatic stress and slave disorders, for example, they talk about intergenerational trauma. And if we're not engaging with, with young people and um, their traumas, then the wounds that have been created from a range of things, whether that is physical, systemic, economic, social, economic, or whatever, if we're not seeking to engage those wounds, then what we're doing is we're just putting plasters on it. 
So therapeutic interventions with youth workers, what we should be doing, and this is what I advocate for, we need to be working more so in conjunction with therapists. Therapists need to move from beyond the table. So it's not just us, because we're out there. It needs to be those that have mental health knowledge and mental health expertise, therapists and counsellors, move from behind the desk and stop assuming that young people are going to go into their room and they bring it to the street. So we find new ways and new methodologies. And I'm not saying that we have the methodology right now, but I would like to think that those that are in the room that are working in conjunction with the National Youth Agency, we now start thinking, how can we bring therapy on road? How can we bring therapy to the streets? Because if young people go to the barber shop and talk to the barber about their issues, go to the local bookie, go to the local pub to talk about their issues, then maybe there's spaces where therapy needs to take place. But because we've got a traditional mindset that if you're unwell or you need some support um, or you need to talk to someone, you have to come to my building and sign up. And that traditional way is the reason why loads of young people don't sign up to um, organisations or get any help towards um, uh, issues around their mental health, their stresses or their anger within society. And when we don't do that, we can understand why extremism is on the rise, radicalization is on the rise from all groups and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Craig. You have a Thank blessed day. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm really sorry, guys, because we, we have reached um, half past 11. Um, I think we can all say that it has been a, a really informative uh, webinar for us today. Um, I have got more questions. I'm going to copy those across um, to, to Craig as well. But, but please, if anybody does have any more questions, please email Craig. Um, and again, just to say a huge thank you to you all. Thanks very much for, for your time. Uh, just to say as well, there are more webinars coming up. There's one in particular around, around loss as well. That's going to be put out in the next couple of weeks uh, under the NYA. So please keep on checking our website. Uh, and please, you know, share this on social media and, and tell us what you, what you thought. But can I just, can we just do a virtual round of applause for, for Craig, please, just to say a huge thank you for that. Really appreciate your time. Um, and thanks, guys. And, you know, stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Peace.